Hi, Nigel here from lawforrebel.com. Ideas are powerful. They motivate us. The ideas that people accept and take on board determine their choice of behaviour, their attitudes, what they will tolerate, what they'll put up with, what they'll pursue and what they don't. Also, it's important to note that the ideas that people reject determine their behaviour. And it, it, that affects the things that they specifically won't do. So ideas are powerful. They motivate us. If you want to control an individual or a population, you have to control the ideas that are accepted and rejected. So, for example, if you believe that selfishness is bad, you will probably demonstrate to those around you, you might you know, call it virtue signalling, but you'll demonstrate helping others. If you believe that the sun is bad for you, you'll stay out of it or put on plenty of sun cream. If you hold that eating meat is bad, you will be motivated to become a vegetarian. If you, as you get old, you think that forgetting things is, is just part of getting old and, and aches and pains and, you know, problems with, with uh, your body are part of getting old, then you won't read those feedback signs from your body telling you of the incorrect lifestyle choices you've been making for the last couple of decades. So ideas are powerful, they motivate us and they determine our behaviour. And this is true both individually and with large groups. You know, countries, civilizations, an entire culture is only a large number of individuals and so the same thing carries for, for nations, for civilizations. Ideas determine behavior. And the thing about ideas is that there's necessarily a time lag between exposure to the idea, assimilation of the idea, and then action based on that idea. It can't happen the other way around. You can't act on an idea that you haven't yet been exposed to or heard or accepted. So ideas are downloaded, if you like, or heard or, or exposed to them. And we can, we can either be consciously aware of the ideas or we can just absorb them by osmosis from our surrounding culture. So first there's exposure and then there's a period of assimilation. And again, this may be conscious or unconscious. You may deliberately think about that idea to go on holiday to Corfu and then decide to do it and go there. Or you may, somebody introduces you to, I don't know, a new product, a new drone or something, and you think, wow, that's good. And you assimilate the idea, you think about it, and then you act. So there's, there's this necessary time delay. It can't be the other way round. So this fact this principle, the identification of this principle, can help us to see what's likely to happen in individuals' behaviour and in groups of people's behaviour, indeed the behaviour of an entire culture. If we examine the ideas that are held by either the individual or the group, we've got a fairly good idea as to what's coming down the pipe in terms of behavior, in terms of attitudes, in terms of tolerations, in terms of what values will be pursued, in terms of what is determined to be good, what's bad, what's normal, what's acceptable, what's desirable, what should we not do. So the point of this is that when we look around us, and we observe the dominant ideas in our Western culture, we can see that there are many ideas widely held, I would say by almost everyone, a very high percentage of the population, that 
stand in the way of human freedom, that ability to act on one's own judgment. There are lots of ideas that negate freedom, that prevent freedom from happening, because freedom is a condition, a political condition, that requires certain ideas to be held by the majority for that condition to be possible. So I'm going to outline just three of the many ideas that I've identified that are currently blocking freedom. The first is the idea that sacrifice uh, and giving up our values is good, that we are our brother's keeper and that helping others is a moral duty. Now this is not the same as kindness, it's not the same as a desire to help or genuinely wanting to help someone out, consideration for others, this is not the same. Altruism is a code of morality handed down across the millennia that is deeply entrenched in our Western civilization from the religions which all unanimously espouse the virtue of giving up values, self-sacrifice to the group, to the tribe, to the emperor, to the pharaoh, to the state, to the proletariat. Giving up is held to be good. But it runs even deeper than this. Altruism holds that you have no right to live for your own sake. You exist for the benefit of others, for the tribe, for the group, for the collective. This, that's why you have this moral duty. It is the right thing to do to sacrifice to the group. Altruism holds that it is wrong to focus on self exclusively, to look after your own rational needs, to serve your own aspirations, dreams, to pursue your own life plan, if you like, your career. It holds that it is good to spend some of your time in soup kitchens or helping others. And, and the standard of, of excellence is something like Mother Teresa giving up her whole life in service to others. That, that is held as the pinnacle of goodness. So, Obviously, a lot of us don't hold altruism to that degree, but almost everybody accepts on some level, to some degree, that this is the way forward. It is good. And altruism is really the morality of a slave. It predisposes the individual and the group to giving up values. It's the perfect idea to underpin statism, collectivism, communism, slavery. So while this idea is so widely held, it serves as a roadblock to freedom. The second idea that is widely held is that, that is a roadblock to freedom is that capitalism is evil. Most people think of fat cats, greed and exploitation whenever they hear about capitalism. Capitalism, the word, has been well propagandized to, to be associated with bad stuff, bad economic outcomes. The woes, poverty is due to capitalism, etc, etc. So this is a very widely held belief. You don't have pro-capitalism rallies, you see anti-capitalist demonstrations. And this is tragic because it reveals a lack of understanding of what capitalism is, and it points to the success of propaganda. Capitalism is the solution to the problem of human freedom. It isn't the cause of any problem. 
It's the only socio-economic system that's based on the concept of property rights and voluntary actions of individuals being uncoerced, no force. So pure laissez-faire capitalism says you have the right to exist for your own sake. You own your own life, your own body, and you own the product of your own effort. If you spend your time making stuff, it's yours. If you sell it, you keep all the money. So capitalism is very, very much misunderstood and misrepresented, deliberately, I would suggest. And it's widely held that we have a system of capitalism. It's always blamed, you know, that this is the implication is that, or the idea is that it, people tend to think that we have a capitalist system and that's why, you know, the problems are blamed on it. But in truth, we don't. We, we, a, a system of pure laissez-faire cap, laissez capitalism has never existed. It came closest to existing in uh, 19th century America. And, uh, and earlier, just after the creation of the uh, independent state of the uh, of, uh, United States. But it was very quickly diluted with state control regulations and very quickly descended into a mixed economy. And the degree of capitalism within the, our economy is, is minimized because it's the magic fuel that drives uh, economic growth and prosperity. They, it couldn't be got rid of entirely. But the point is that we don't have a system of capitalism. We have just enough freedom of uh, and property rights, just enough to make the system work. So the point here is that there is a misconception of capitalism. It's seen as evil and the problem when, in fact, if people knew what it was, they would realise that it's the solution. And while these, this idea is widely held, and it is, there really is little chance for, for freedom to flourish. There's little chance of a capitalist system being demanded, being expected, being wanted, being striven for in the minds of a population that thinks it's the problem. So it's difficult to see how the system of human freedom can come into being in these circumstances. The third very powerful and fundamental idea that serves as a roadblock to freedom is the idea that of believing in things without evidence. The idea that you can just choose what ideas to accept or reject, choose one's beliefs from a sort of a, a buffet selection without any reason, evidence, proof, logic, without understanding, without fully integrating an understanding on which those ideas are based, without a standard of truth by which to measure their rightness or wrongness, their truth or their falsity. And this is essentially a form of secular mysticism, which is rife these days. The vast majority of people are over eager to delegate to authority in terms of knowing what's real, what's true and what to believe in. An unhealthy degree of delegation to authority, I would suggest. faith is invoked when you when you when you take on board the mainstream narrative or listen to your national news and accept it without question you are implicitly taking the reasons on faith you are accepting it as true without concerning yourself with the rational argument that actually proves shows demonstrates that the idea is true and faith, of course, comes from the religions. It's been handed down to us. The uh, idea of believing in things, believing in the sky daddy, believing in 
um, all sorts of mystic traditions has long been with the human race. It's entrenched, it's very, very deeply embedded into people's consciousness. When you consider the number of people that either believe that somehow you create your own reality or that believe in an afterlife or believe in a God, we can see that the predisposition to believe in things that either have no evidence or that are contradicted by the evidence is extremely widespread. So while this is the case, it's very difficult to see how people will not be duped and convinced that false ideas are true. Only when sufficient people care to follow reason, evidence, logic, proof and the rational argument, only when sufficient people care to understand and have a real knowledge rather than a mind full of floating abstractions that they can't explain. Only when that happens will we be able to resist being misled, being duped and conned into buying into false ideas, ideas that don't correlate with reality. It's easy to fool someone and to dupe someone, a con man, have a field day with somebody who's as we might say, gullible, happy to believe in things without reasons. And the mind that can be convinced that a false idea is true can be frightened. And we see that happening a lot. And we, once people are in fear, of course, everybody knows, we resort to this fight or flight, the frontal cortex shuts down, and we are even less able to think for ourselves, think clearly and find the truth. So it's absolutely imperative that the human race, the, the individual and the group, eventually get to a point where they stop this, the, or they reject this idea, this implicit idea, that accepting ideas without evidence and reasons, accepting ideas on faith, is acceptable. That's the a fundamental idea that needs to be reversed. And I'm sure you'll agree, you, you know, when you look around you, I, I f can't find many people, even in amongst the truth seeking community, who aren't mystics to some degree. And you only have to look around to see the degree to which the mainstream narrative is swallowed whole by most people without question to see the degree to which people are happy to take things on faith. And this is the third fundamental reason why humanity's in the dire straits and the serious predicament that it is in now. It's only by understanding the reasons that freedom can't occur now that we can possibly change things and put in place the reasons that freedom can flourish. It's only by understanding the causes of things that we can change them. And the Western world at the moment is currently descending into totalitarianism, which is a form of government that is centralised, dictatorial, and requires complete subservience to the state. Now, last century, we saw many examples of totalitarianism, Soviet Russia, Nazi Germany, Pol Pot's Cambodia. And we also saw that more men, women and children, innocent men, women and children died at the hands of the state, the totalitarian state last century, than were killed by any natural disasters, famines, sickness and disease, and even two world wars totalitarianism, the rise of the state, is bad news. Last century it was isolated, this time around it's going global. We're in a very, very serious predicament here and we must reverse the ideas that support it. So we've discussed some of the reasons why freedom has no chance at the moment in the short term. 
but that, that it does have a chance if we can grasp that these reasons need to be changed. If we can see what needs to be done, then we can begin to make that happen. Until we see what needs to be done, until we understand the conditions or, or the ideas that underpin freedom, or when we do understand them, I should say, then we can move proactively towards freedom. We can campaign for it. So I do hope this helps. Um, thank you for listening. And we must all try and advocate the right ideas. I highly recommend learning what is altruism, what is statism, um, what is capitalism and socialism. Know the difference. We must understand that mysticism is not acceptable. And to help us grasp these ideas, I recommend looking into the writings of Ayn Rand, one of the most brilliant minds, I think, ever. Um, look into her work. Be cautious of the Ayn Rand Institute, because I think they have simply been hijacked by, by the, the, uh, the same interests that control the media. And in spite of them championing the ideas that Ayn Rand uh, espoused, they, they still swallow the, the mainstream narrative whole and reject any controversial ideas as conspiracy, conspiracy theories, theories. So be careful there. But anyway, thank you for listening and do check out the website, lawforrebel.com. There's stacks more on there. Please hit the like button if you've got some value from this and do share it and do join me again next time here on Lawful Rebel TV. See you.